Julie, today's topic is a pillar of sports medicine and incredibly important. Cardiac arrest is as serious as it gets and, and certainly even more serious or maybe more traumatic when it hits young, seemingly healthy uh, people. And in these cases, like that we talked about in the intro, these are peak performing athletes. It's incredibly jaw dropping to think about these people who we look at and we're like, you're the fittest person I know. And then they collapse of cardiac arrest and you say, how can that happen? So the cases above have fortunately have had good outcomes to date. Both athletes, as far as I know, are doing very well, but their notoriety has certainly allowed us to expand the conversation about preventing these situations in the future. So with that, I'm super excited to bring on our expert today. I want to introduce everybody to Dr. John Dresner. John is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and director of the UW Medicine Center for Sports Cardiology at the University of Washington. He serves as the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and he's a team physician for the Seattle Seahawks, the OL Reign of the NWSL, and the University of Washington, the newest member of the Big Ten. Dr. Dresner is a past president of the American Medical uh, Society of Sports Medicine, AMSSM, which is our big organization, and he's dedicated his career to the prevention of study, excuse me, sudden cardiac arrest and death, SCA slash D, in young athletes and the development of effective models for prevention. So he fits this. I mean, I couldn't think of anybody better to be on for this. So John, can't thank you enough for coming on and joining us. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Julie. I'm really, really glad to be here. Yeah, this is uh, an awesome topic. And I know that when these big stories came out, you were quoted in big publications. I People want your time and we're so, we're so grateful to have it. So before we dive in, we'd love to hear about your journey to your current role. Sports cardiology is I think a relatively young field and maybe people didn't even know that there was sports cardiology. You're a family doctor. You paved the way for a lot of this. Maybe give us your story, your biopic. Who is John Dresner? Yeah. Well, um, how long do we have to talk about that? Right. <laughs> as long um, as you want, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, for our listeners, you know, sports cardiology really uh, is a, a relatively new field. And I think you can get to it from different routes. You know, my route comes from the sports medicine side, but I would say the majority of, uh, of people who practice in the sports cardiology space are cardiologists with, with a strong interest in, in heart issues and athletes. You know, for me, I was first exposed to athletic heart changes and sudden cardiac death in athletes through a medical school rotation in my fourth year at UCLA. And it just struck a chord with me. I was a college basketball player. I played at Brown University. And during my era was when Hank Gathers died. And that was an incredibly tragic event, you know, public view, um, really no on court resuscitation, just an incredible tragedy followed soon thereafter by Reggie Lewis, Len Bias, and sort of other basketball players who had cardiac arrest. And then in medical school, was interested in everything. My favorite rotation was the, the cardiac intensive care unit <laughs> and this rotation in sports medicine. And then I did a family medicine residency and it all just sort of stayed with me. Um, and eventually my, my first publication was on uh, screening and prevention of sudden cardiac death. And my first research project, interestingly, was was asking the question of whether or not we should put AEDs, you know, those, those portable defibrillators, automated external defibrillators, you know, in the collegiate setting. That was back in 2003. Um, where now we know that answer is absolutely yes. And, and because of some of that research, AEDs have really become standard in our collegiate and, and high school athletic setting. But then I realized that, that even with AEDs, there were still a lot of young athletes who were dying. And it made me turn towards the other side of prevention. You know, how can we screen these athletes and prevent these tragedies from happening? And I think it it, it, it required that I look closely at common practices within the U.S., sort of this history and physical based, you know, sports physical that really we learn is like the foundation of sports medicine. We hang our hat on it. And it unfortunately it really has no evidence that it works. And mm -hmm. our European colleagues who have for decades now done something different using an electrocardiogram or an EKG to help us sort of look under the hood for those heart conditions that are silent, but can be, but can be killers. And, and that sort of just sparked a fire to help our discipline, sports medicine physicians do what we're supposed to do, but do it better. You know, we all have to do sports physicals. No one wants to do a bad job. So if we're going to do screening, let's do it well. 
It was really like a really good kind of like overview of where we're headed with this episode. You must have done a podcast before. Well done, Dr. <laughs> Kessner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. John, like, so for example, tomorrow I'm slated to give a, a PowerPoint lecture to our sports medicine fellows about how to do an effective pre-participation physical exam. <laughs> So should I just tell him it's all horseshit? Don't bother. <laughs> what do you end. think? What, yeah. What's you know? I get. I guess it depends on what the end of your of your yeah. of your presentation is. Are you talking about electrocardiograms and using mm-hmm. you know an EKG, or are you not? Because if you're not, I think you can probably just skip the whole lecture and go out to lunch and get to know your fellows, <laughs> and you haven't missed anything. Um, you know, we, it, it, it's true, and unfortunately, it's true. I mean, we're taught. You know, these history questionnaires that, that kids have to fill out. I've got three children. They've all filled them out through their years. We see them over and over again. All our states require them. And when people fill out these questionnaires, there's a high false positive response. You know, you, we have these heart health questions. You know, 20, 25% of kids check one of the boxes that they have, you know, one of these symptoms. The, the, the wording of the questions is not validated and scientifically, like, developed. Um, they're very wordy. You know, what kid hasn't experienced pressure, tightness, you know, chest pain with exercise or feeling short of breath with exercise? Like they're just poorly written. The physical exam we do with the stethoscope is is really old school. Um, we've published research that really none of us are good at distinguishing a pathologic heart murmur from a physiologic heart murmur. And so which is really the, the the main like sort of focus of how we've learned PPEs or, or sports physicals in medical school was we have to listen a certain way to the athlete. We're going to listen to you standing and laying down and holding your breath and listen for this heart murmur where most of the time with the disease we're looking for, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that heart murmur doesn't exist. Right. And if we do hear a heart murmur, we're not very good at distinguishing if it's normal or abnormal. And so no one's getting the right workup anyway. And if we just did an EKG, we'd understand if they have cardiomyopathy or not. And so I think what people forget here is that the single primary objective of doing a sports physical is the identification of heart conditions that put kids at risk for sudden death. And we've chosen for decades now to use a tool, a questionnaire and a stethoscope that don't work, that don't identify those kids. And so why not use a different tool for the exact same purpose that actually statistically performs much better, but only if you know what you're doing. And so, as you know, within the sports medicine community, we've spent, you know, a lot of time and effort to try to train our sports medicine colleagues that EKG interpretation and accurate interpretation is really a fundamental skill. It's, it's not like only the people who are interested in sports cardiology should be able to do this. I think if you're a sports medicine physician, this is absolutely a fundamental skill. You should be good at it and you should be doing it frequently. It should distinguish you from just a primary care provider that has a lot of other things to focus on and maybe hasn't spent the time to learn ECG interpretation in athletes. So for your lecture tomorrow, I, I, I hope it's good. I'm sure it will be. It'll be great. We've got lots of resources we can share with you about how to um, learn ECG interpretation for your fellows. Boy, I hope they do our training modules. We know all about the, the international criteria. Um, but I think if you want to make a difference for them, preparing them long term to hopefully help identify the conditions at risk, I think it has to include a, an EKG. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The reason to do a pre-participation physical is there's a lot of reasons. One, because it's required. So you have to. You have to get this thing done or else you can't play. And so I think that it becomes a very perfunctory thing that some primary care providers and sports medicine physicians do to check off a box so that this kid can go do the thing. And I don't think that that's doing our duty and our service to our yeah. patients sometimes. And if it's just like, yeah, 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 yeah you're fine. I think you've lost a, a, a an opportunity for one fulfilling that duty. I mean, I would certainly say that there's other parts of the the exam that are helpful just for like general health things. Great, but if our if our goal, like you're saying, John, is to screen for conditions and prevent sudden cardiac death, I agree with you wholeheartedly that yeah, it ain't cutting it. 
Right. This really gets at what the purpose of that evaluation is, right? So if, if the purpose is to attract adolescents into their primary care provider for a general health screen, then there may be some value. I'm going to check your blood pressure. I'm going to do a social check. Are you safe at home? I'm going to do a mental health screen. I'm going to tell you not to smoke, wear a helmet, use a condom. And, and there's some preventive things there that you can do that, that may yeah. be of value. But when you look at the literature of why kids are getting sports physicals, the primary objective is the identification of, of conditions that put them at risk of catastrophic injury or sudden death. And for many kids who don't have access to care, the creation of a required sports physical has been a barrier to sports participation. And it unfortunately, you know, disproportionately affects those who don't have good access to care, who who don't have the financial resources, who may not have insurance. At the end of this month, our sports medicine group is volunteering our time to perform sports physicals at a school district within the state of Washington that has the, the, the most socioeconomic um, deprivation than anyone else. Sorry, there we go. For the record, John's <laughs> lights just went out. Yeah, that's what happens when you sit too long at my desk and the lights just He's go out. He's a pro and he just or, flailed or you're and just came trying back to quiet me, Or you're just trying to quiet me in the middle of the podcast, which is also <laughs> it's probably happened to me before. That's a, so. that's a pro right there, man. Just smooth as butter. Keep going, John. <laughs> yeah, so... But anyway, so at the end of the month, we're doing these sports physicals in a in a student population with, with very low resources and access to care for really the sole purpose of, of allowing the opportunity to play sports. And I know that the creators of the of the sports physical and the, the pre-participation evaluation, that the, the, the goal was not to create barriers. But in reality, we have we've created a mandatory evaluation that actually costs a ton of resources and money that has really no proven benefit outside of just a normal well child care check, but that's not really the main purpose and we're not using the right tools. And so if we're really going to step back, the right thing to do, which we'll never be able to do at this point is to either rewind or just dismantle the way we do sports physicals and recreate it, but, but we don't. And I think it's a little different when you are, a team physician, maybe at a college setting or a professional setting where you're now acquiring a new patient into your practice. And that sports physical is that opportunity to get to know their health history and their health concerns, current injuries, as well as that heart screen. But for our adolescents, our middle school and high school athletes who are required to get the sports physicals, you know, they're, they're, they're getting the sports physical to check the box and not necessarily for that general health screen. I feel like we nosedived right into prevention and I'm just going to keep hammering home. We can always go back and talk about the other stuff because this is good. So yeah. what is your current outlook on our ability to actually prevent this from happening? So if we did what you said, can we prevent this from happening to these athletes that we're hearing more about? I think we can. I think we can prevent it. I think we can do a much better job than we are. But I think everyone has to recognize that no matter what we do from a screening standpoint, it's not perfect. It's not perfect we're always going to hear about cases of sudden cardiac arrest in young athletes, because no matter how we screen them, we will never identify all of the potential disorders that can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. And there are some disorders that can be acquired over time. And so a single time point in screen doesn't necessarily protect you forever. And you have to have the other side of prevention and be prepared to respond to sudden cardiac arrest in the case of an emergency. And I, I know we'll talk about what that means and the availability of AEDs and how we've seen that, you know, save DeMar Hamlin and how, you know, we've heard that that's exactly what happened to save Bronny. And so um, I do think that we can do better. I think when we use an EKG, an EKG should suggest or identify about two thirds of the heart conditions that place a young person at risk for sudden cardiac arrest. And so that's pretty good. Um, and what comes next is really important because there's lots of evidence, disease specific evidence that when you have early detection and intervene, when you do risk stratification, where you treat certain diseases with medications or certain diseases with heart ablations or certain patients that are really high risk get an internal defibrillator, 
that these interventions save lives. And so I really believe that as screening has, you know, as this um, pendulum has swung more and more to better screening, use of an EKG, more early detection of those heart illnesses, that we are going to have this opportunity for better management of these disorders before they're ever a problem. And management doesn't always mean disqualification from sports. The whole goal is to hopefully keep kids playing sports, but safer than they are, knowing what they have if they have a heart condition.